Should we let the people in who are there? Sure. Hola, well Nadia. Hola, buenas noches. Nadia. Hola, Hi, Nadia. Nadia. Hola. Hola, Edwina. Hello, Edwina. Welcome. Welcome, welcome, everyone. Hola, muchas gracias. So oh, good to see you, Edwina. Amy, thank you for the invite. I'm I'm here to support. That's great. Let's just um wait another minute. All right, well, why don't we get started? Welcome, bienvenidos. My name is Gayla King. I'm the Regional Program Director with Interfaith Movement for Human Integrity. I want to bring on um, the interpreter for tonight, Danny, so he can, um, he can get folks set up with interpretation. Gracias, Gayla. Thank you, Gayla. Um, hello, everybody, and welcome. Um, welcome to everybody who has been working with us, and thank you for gathering this evening. And uh, welcome to the new faces that we have here today. I will be giving instructions on how to access interpretation because we will be having speakers who will be speaking multiple languages today, and we want to make sure that we honor their words, their experiences. And also, we want to encourage everybody to participate um, with the dialogue as, as we go through today's gathering. I will say this now in Spanish. Hola, muy buenas tardes a todas, todes y todos a este espacio. Es muy lindo compartir este espacio con ustedes. Uh, bienvenidos a todos que han trabajado con nosotros en el pasado. Y también especialmente queremos a invitar y bienvenir a las nuevas caras que se están juntando con nosotros el día de hoy. Uh, como ustedes ya están acostumbrados, en este espacio practicamos lo que es la justicia del lenguaje. Así que queremos que todos uh, sigan las instrucciones para que puedan acceder a la interpretación. En un momento vamos a aprender la interpretación. Solamente pedimos que se aseguren de seleccionar si quieren escuchar la presentación en español o en inglés. Uh, porque en el audio original va a, va a hablar gente en diferentes idiomas. And so, if you are using a computer, um, okay, uh, you will be seeing uh, in a little bit, once we turn on the interpretation function, you will be seeing this icon of a globe. Uh, we ask you to select the globe, which will open up a different menu for you to select and make sure you select either English or Spanish. In this case, uh, it would be English as the language that you will be hearing. You will be hearing um, softly the original audio. And when people speak Spanish, you will be hearing me uh, interpret to English. Now, if you are using a phone or a tablet, your menu is going to look a little bit different. You won't see the globe, but you will see the three dots on your lower right-hand side. Selecting the three dots will pop up another menu on which you can select interpretation. And from there, you will be seeing um, the option to select English or Spanish. Uh, just make sure that you click on the 
upper hand side uh, where it says to finalize or done, it should, it should say done uh, in blue words to save your changes. Now in Spanish. Y bueno, quienes están usando la computadora van a ver en su parte inferior de su pantalla el mundo, un globo. Seleccionando el globo va a poder seleccionar el lenguaje de su preferencia. Ahora quienes están usando el teléfono, su imagen o su pantalla se va a ver un poquito diferente. En lugar de globo, ustedes van a ver estos tres puntos que están en la imagen. Que es, dice más para abrir un menú más extenso. En este menú va a poder encontrar donde dice interpretación o interpretation, language interpretation en inglés. Ah, seleccionando ahí va a poder seleccionar su idioma de preferencia que sería español. Asegúrense de seleccionar donde dice done o finalizado para guardar los cambios. Muy bien. Y bueno, como siempre queremos animarles a que cualquier dificultad que tengan con el con Zoom o con la interpretación, nos dejen saber por medio de el chat. And like always, we encourage you to reach out to us if you have any issues with the audio or with Zoom. Uh, feel free to reach out to us by chat. Uh, y con eso queremos animarles de nuevo a que participen uh, eh, usando el lenguaje de su preferencia. Y si uh, hay algún asunto de que ocupan que digamos algo una vez más o estamos hablando muy rápido, déjenos saber por medio del chat. And like always, we want to encourage you to participate in whichever language you feel most comfortable. And if there is any issue, uh, if you miss something during our conversation or during the presentation, feel free to let us know on the chat. Uh, also, if we you need us to slow down or you feel me, um, yeah, if you need us to slow down, feel free to let us know on the chat. With that said, uh, Gail is going to turn on the interpretation. So from there, you will be either seeing the icon of the globe or the three dots that say more. Y con eso dicho, ahora Gail... All right. So I hope... Great. So I think that was Reynaldo's thumbs up. Wonderful. Thank you, Danny, for making sure that we um, can make this evening accessible to Reynaldo and others that, um, that are with us. So thank you all for joining us. I just wanted to share a few, a little bit about our organization. For those that are new to interfaith movement, we are a statewide organization practicing collective liberation in three parts of the state, in Northern California, Los Angeles, and the Inland Empire. The next slide, the mission and part of our vision of the organization is we are a multiracial multi-faith organization working for the dignity and full inclusion of immigrants and people impacted by incarceration. We envision a world where every person is valued as sacred across all bars and across all borders. Next slide. We, we approach this mission and vision using these three core strategies. And everyone on this call has participated in some way in our organization. One of the strategies is by transforming leaders of people directly impacted by these systems, transforming narrative by lifting up stories, humanizing stories of people impacted by these systems, 
and transforming our policies and practices by working on local and state policies, organizing vigils, pilgrimages, and participating in, a, in accompaniment, accompanying people impacted by these systems. And last, we just wanted to share the values that undergird our organization. We are an abolition organization um, and we center ourselves in these values that all people are created in the image of God and all are sacred, that we promote preventing harm and not committing harm by loving our neighbors and one another. And we share a collective responsibility for everyone and each other in society, um, as well as all living non-humans, we, we share that responsibility. And this responsibility includes repairing past harms that have been committed while we continue to work um, today to address the root causes of mass incarceration and criminalization. So for today, we're going to um, share about these three four topics. We're going to first talk about some of the root causes of immigration. And we have, we're joined by Professor Amy Arginal from UC Santa Cruz and Reynaldo Dominguez, recently immigrated from Honduras. Then we're going to get a really special video from um, Jesus de la Torre about the border and what is happening there from, he is with Hope Border Institute. After that, we're gonna hear from Reverend Deb Brilly and Jose Rubin, staff with our organization about immigrant detention and what we're doing to dismantle those systems. And then last, we'll hear some reflections on this election that, um, that is, we're in the middle of. So that's gonna be the flow for tonight. And with that, I just want to, um, pass it over to Professor Amy to also introduce Ray. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Gayla. And thank you for having this space. Um, we're going to start by honoring um, uh, our friend and compañero Juan Lopez. Um, Reynaldo Dominguez um, is really was a partner of, of Juan Lopez. And so Reynaldo will introduce and say a few words for us to honor Juan's, Juan's memory. Um, we're gonna watch then a short video of Juan speaking, and then we'll go back to Reynaldo to talk about the struggle in Guapinol and his story. Uh, and then I'll end off this section with just some kind of larger um, big theme <laughs> of root causes um, in the region. So Reynaldo, I'm going to pass it to you to share uh, a few words um, to, to bring in the memory of our dear compañero Juan Antonio Lopez. So I'll pass it to you, Ray. Muchísimas gracias, compañeras, compañeros, hermanas y hermanos. Eh, que han estado de cerca en esta lucha que hemos emprendido hace seis años de una forma eh, muy pacífica, defendiendo única y exclusivamente el agua y la montaña que la produce, como es el Parque Nacional Montaña de Botaderos, Carlos Escalera. Creo que dejamos sumamente claros con el compañero Juan López del 2019 que vinimos a recibir el premio a Washington, el premio Letelier, Letelier Mufi, y que hicimos una gira por eh, San Francisco en donde Débora Lee y otro grupo de compañeras y compañeros tuvieron la oportunidad de escuchar de viva voz al gran peligro que no sometíamos y que éramos sometidos por parte de las empresas 
extractivas que eh, están explotando proyectos de minería. Juan no se mereció realmente ese tipo de muerte, porque es un, era un compañero de iglesia, principalmente de iglesia. Hicimos una lucha con él hasta el día 14 de septiembre, recién pasado, que lo que nosotros veníamos exigiendo era el derecho a la vida, el derecho a un ambiente sano que está contemplado en las leyes de todo país. Juan, Juan fue un compañero muy hábil, un compañero muy humilde, un hermano de iglesia muy eh, arraigada a su fe, de trabajar en beneficio de todos y todas las demás personas que se les vulneran su derecho. A mí en lo personal, esta tragedia de la muerte de nuestro compañero Juan me dobló, me quebró y nos puso a todo el comité en un altísimo riesgo en la zona. Y creo que el desplazamiento nuestro lo tocará muy bien eh, Amy más adelante, que es la causa de las migraciones. Y, y Débora Lee también, que conoce mucho de esto, y Jesús. Entonces, eh, hemos sentido, sentido, pero en nuestro interior, y sentido como, como que realmente a nuestros corazones los mordió un animal y los tiene prensados con la muerte de nuestro compañero. Es decir, eh, por el simple hecho de defender la vida, llegamos a, a, a ser con Juan unos compañeros y compañeras inseparables. Y en memoria, en este espacio, qué mejor para nuestro compañero, porque se merece esto y mucho más. Muchísimas gracias, Ray. Thank you so much, Ray. I'm going to play a short video and then I'm going to come back to you for a little bit about your own story as well. So let me get the video ready. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry, y'all. Okay. Cuando uno se mete en este país a defender eh, los bienes comunes, los bienes naturales, los bienes públicos, lógicamente entra en choque con los grandes intereses y por tanto hay gran inseguridad. Si uno sale de su casa, uno siempre tiene en mente que no sabe qué le puede pasar y si puede volver a su casa y volver a ver la familia. Yo mismo en alguna ocasión eh, recibí de parte de un funcionario del gobierno municipal la advertencia de que si no negociábamos con la empresa, nos pasaría lo que le pasó a Berta Cáceres. Lo tomé como una amenaza. Eso que llamamos justicia en este país, tiene a veces nombre y apellido. Estamos hablando de, de una justicia, a veces doblegada por el gran capital. Y... Esta lucha nuestra, compañeras y compañeros, es frente a una violación a derechos humanos. ¿Quién viola derechos humanos? Según la legislación hondureña e internacional, solamente el Estado de Honduras. ¿Cuándo violentó nuestro derecho? Cuando de manera corrupta, de manera malintencionada, de manera desvergonzada, manipularon, los, los, manipularon el decreto legislativo de creación de ese parque donde no se puede hacer actividad ni siquiera agrícola. En la zona núcleo, mucho menos minería. Yo nací para amar la vida, nací para, para querer la vida y para luchar por la vida. Y en... Diddy's a weird dude. From disturbing footage of Diddy's freak off island. Doing these satanic rituals on his victims. These are the 20.
Ray, I'm going to pass it back to you to share a little bit about your own story, um, the past couple of years, a little bit about Guapinol and the struggle, and your your journey here to to the U.S. having to migrate. So, if you would share um, some of your words, you already started to share about the struggle of Juan, and you and Juan were part of that struggle. And so, I'm going to pass it back to you to share a little bit about this story. Bueno, eh, sí, realmente esta historia de defender los ríos, de defender las zonas protegidas como es el parque, nos ha llevado a, a muchas tragedias, como por ejemplo, para señalar única y exclusivamente tres. En primer lugar, estar presos por defender el, el agua, los ríos. En segundo lugar, los desplazamientos como el que realmente eh, tengo eh, junto a mi familia y muchas personas más de la comunidad. Y en tercer lugar, los asesinatos. Es decir, eh, ya lo que, lo que ha pasado con el asesinato de nuestro compañero Juan y de otros compañeros, de mis hermanos, eh, Jairo, Ali y Ali, o okay, que Ali, perdón, eh, dan como la pauta para que nosotros, como luchadores y luchadoras, eh, tengamos temor y abandonemos, ¿verdad?, la lucha y las empresas se queden. Eh, destruyendo eh, el ambiente y destruyendo las comunidades. Esta lucha la hemos hecho así a partir del 2018 con mucha fuerza, es decir, con tomas de carreteras, tomas de edificios públicos, eh, con eh, posicionamientos, comunicados, denuncias. Les hemos llevado el rastro a los funcionarios que se han dejado doblar el brazo para dar paso a que estos empresarios y este tipo de empresas eh, destruyan nuestros bienes naturales. Lo que Juan dice es es algo que en la iglesia lo tenemos claro. No podemos permitir ni sentarnos a negociar absolutamente con nadie los ríos, porque sería sentarnos a negociar la vida, la vida de las comunidades y la vida de la población. Como él dice, allí en ese parque no se puede hacer ni siquiera eh, actividades agrícolas porque es la zona realmente de donde nace el agua no se puede poner en riesgo mucho menos minería que es, estamos hablando de minería a cielo abierto que es decir botar toda la montaña y sacar los minerales a toda costa y dejar un desastre ambiental en las comunidades ¿de dónde viene esta acción nuestra? viene de un evangelio el, del que dice Juan, que por cierto lo han llamado acá el discípulo más amado. Viene de que hay que amar la vida. El amar los ríos y el amar la, las montañas que producen el oxígeno es amar la vida. Y si estos bienes, decíamos nosotros con Juan, hay que defenderlos con la vida, pues hay que hacerlo. Y realmente ahí es donde las palabras de Juan se cumplen. Y dice, al enfrentarnos a este tipo de, de proyectos y de empresarios, uno no está seguro, uno no sabe si va a regresar a casa. 
Y es más, uno no sabe si le va a tocar que le quiten la vida frente a su familia, como le pasó a Oquelí, mi hermano, y le pasó a Juan. Que delante de su familia no tuvieron piedad para cometer estos, estos sicarios, ese tipo de, de, de hecho. Guapinol ha sido una comunidad insignia. Es decir, es como el ícono en donde realmente pasa el río Guapinol eh, rodeando la comunidad de Guapinol y cuando se pone que realmente no se puede utilizar para, para consumo humano el agua por la explotación que está haciendo la empresa minera, entonces es cuando nos levantamos. Entonces es cuando realmente muchas comunidades dicen, si este desarrollo va a traer este tipo de, de consecuencias, este desarrollo así no lo queremos. Y nosotros hemos sido claros y hemos puesto en la mesa nacional e internacional que el desarrollo es bueno, que lo necesitamos el desarrollo, que venga el desarrollo, bienvenido el desarrollo, pero si ese desarrollo nos va a poner en peligro y en riesgo a la población, ese desarrollo así no lo queremos. Y esto es lo que no le ha gustado al empresario, que nosotros le decimos que eso, que dice que es desarrollo y que ha venido a poner en peligro la fuente de agua, ese no es desarrollo. Y él, con las autoridades municipales, locales, está empeñado en llevar a cabo y explotar la montaña. Con todo y la gama de ilegalidades que le hemos sacado a esta empresa, cómo llegó ahí, quiénes la ayudaron, el empresario no está a gusto. Y dijo ya, nuestro compañero Juan lo había dicho, yo recibí de un funcionario municipal estas palabras, lo tomé como una amenaza. A todos nosotros los han amenazado. A todos nosotros el comité lo, lo tienen amenazado. Y miren cómo comenzó la situación. Comenzó por Guapinol, judicializando a la gran mayoría de personas de Guapinol, porque fuimos los primeros en levantarnos a defender estos bienes naturales. Y luego, cuando no se puede detener Guapinol, entonces pegan el salto y van a asesinar las personas del comité y comienzan por el compañero Juan. Quiero terminar con esto, compañeras, compañeros, hermanas y hermanas. Nos han quitado la cabeza. Con el asesinato de Juan nos han quitado el director de la orquesta porque tenía un olfato de hormiga. Iba Juan con su inteligencia y le confiaban mucho las personas que tenían puestos públicos y le informaban. Estas cosas han sido así, así las ha llevado la empresa. Por eso, a estas alturas, el empresario está enojado, muy enojado con nosotros. Y ha dicho, con esto termino, y ha dicho el empresario, si nosotros nos vamos de este territorio, no nos vamos a ir de gusto. Eso es una amenaza más. Así que andamos aquí por culpa de este empresario porque quiere eh, a toda costa sacar esta riqueza de nuestro territorio. Un abrazo a todas y todos ustedes, compañeras y compañeras. Gracias, Ray. Thank you so much, Ray, for bringing Juan's memory into this. It's it's so important for us as we think about, um, you know, our current state 
as we think about what's at stake with our current political, with our current politics, right? A politic that has to change so that people can stay home and thrive, not have to leave, not have to lose their life, not have to lose their family members' yes. lives. This is what, what we need from, from our, our political leaders is, is so that people can stay home and thrive. And so really quickly, I, I just want to talk very briefly about a foreign policy that, that our government has um, that really leads to the root causes of migration that Ray was speaking about with Guapinol. Guapinol is situated in a part of Honduras, the Bajo Aguan, which has a long legacy of conflicts over land and resources. And until, until we have political will to solve the crisis of um, these land conflicts, right? Open pit, open iron ore, open pit mining, um, you know, um, commercial fishing, tourism in the region, um, hotels that kick Garifuna peoples off of their lands. Um, you know, in other parts of the country, we have factories in which um, labor laws are being violated. And all of this is done in collaboration with local elites. Um, if you can go to the next slide. You know, we have a history right now of environmental defenders being murdered. So this is a chart from 2020. I actually use this because the numbers are so clear. You can see the number of Honduras at 17 in 2020. In 2023, the leaders of people who've lost their lives defending the environment are Colombia, the Philippines. Honduras is third, but Honduras is first per capita murders of land defenders and environmental defenders. And so this is a politic that we have to see changing. Our own embassy has been pictured with the company um, owner, the, the mining company, um, Lenid Perez, he is the owner. And, and our, our embassy has been pictured with them. Last year, even under the Biden-Harris administration last year, um, the, the embassy visited Guapinol, met with leaders, um, and, and accused them of being against development, which Ray was talking about, right? And that the community is not against development. They just want a development that will allow them to stay home and thrive. So I, I just want to, you know, kind of even zoom out a little bit larger before I... Um, introduce Jesus and bring in the hope video. Um, right now we have a foreign policy that is really sporadic. In Mexico, we are currently supporting the Mexican military to push migrants to the south. So our numbers are lower at the US-Mexico border, but they're lower because the use of force to keep migrants in the southern part of Mexico. And we're seeing that violence happen with the death of, of eight migrants in Chiapas that were murdered by the Mexican military. And then just recently with um, an indigenous father of the church um, murdered for, you know, calling out the violence that's taking place in Chiapas. In Guatemala, we have seen support for democracy, right? In, in with the elections um, that took place, the US government has been supportive. But in El Salvador, with the returning of Bukele and an illegal re-election, re um, the United States government says, well, it's what the people want. So therefore there's not much that we can do. And in Honduras and Nicaragua, what we see is an administration that is openly hostile to the governments, but very friendly to business and capital. And so what we need to think about in terms of these root causes of migration is, is bringing it back to the elections is what are our demands gonna be of a foreign policy that respects the human rights and the dignity of all peoples and not to continue to aid with weapons and military um, so that we can further push those same people that are fleeing our own business interest in the region to then push them out um, from claiming lives of dignity and safety here in the US. So I'm going to introduce, so we'll say um, thank you to Reynaldo for sharing his voice. There's lots of resources I can share this and others if folks put in the chat, I'm happy to do so. I'm going to transition us to share a video of um, Jesus de la Torre from the Hope Border Institute. Um, so in these elections, right, we, we we're not talking really about root causes. What we're talking about is the crisis at the border. And so Jesus is going to give us an overview of the border, but one that is not of crisis, um, but of a place of hope and possibility. And so we'll listen to Jesus's um, thoughts from the border. So I think, Danny, if you stop sharing, I can jump in and share our video. 
and then we can come back and continue the conversation around our, our policies. Make sure I have sound. Good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with you all today, despite I, the fact that I couldn't be there during the webinar. Uh, I'm Jesus de la Torre, pronounce he, him. I'm the Assistant Director for Global Migration at the Hope Border Institute based in El Paso, Ciudad Juarez. Uh, the Hope Border Institute is a faith strategy center that seeks to build solidarity across borders through research, advocacy, organizing, and direct humanitarian work. Probably you have already seen the testimonies of people crossing the border, and currently the reality is very challenging. The Biden administration has implemented sweeping restrictions to asylum, only allowing people to get to a port of entry and seek asylum if they get one of the 1,450 appointments uh, available at a mobile app, CBP-1. Everyone is forced to use the app regardless of their condition, regardless of their needs, uh, regardless of their health condition. And sometimes their lives are in immediate danger and people are told that there is no asylum anymore. And we've, uh, we have heard that during the summer again and again and again. Unfortunately, the consequences of these policies are deadly. Many people are forced to wait in danger. We have documented an increase in kidnappings in Ciudad Juarez, uh, something that has been unprecedented. We published a report about that called Pain as a Strategy, which I invite you all to read if you have time. We have also documented how people are trying to cross through more dangerous routes, particularly through the desert. And that has led to El Paso and our area becoming one of the deadliest. Last year, we broke record numbers of people who were found dead in our border. And this year, we broke those numbers again. During this last fiscal year in El Paso, more than 180 people were found dead while they were trying to seek safety. And at the same time, we see how our border in El Paso has become more militarized due to Operation Lone Star, the Texas operation to implement its own immigration laws. We have more concertina wire, razor wire, agents, agents shooting at families, agents injuring kids, kids being cut by razor wire. And we treat all these people in our clinica, uh, run by volunteer doctors in El Paso and Ciudad Juarez. And we go to humanitarian spaces where we support people in their medical and psychosocial needs. All in all, all these policies to restrict the access to asylum are leading to deadly and inhumane consequences. We know that increasing the pain against people in movement won't deter them from seeking safety. We have seen that in Central America, where we work with faith leaders, where we work with indigenous leaders, with uh, women leaders, in defending the right to stay, the right to stay in a dignified way, uh, in a clean environment, in thriving democracies where they can express what they want without the threats of being killed in places free of violence, including gender violence, in places where in some they can thrive. But however, the policies supporting those efforts have remained insufficient and still they have focused on private investments, something that the communities may not necessarily need when private investment is causing some of those uh, pains for them, including extractivist businesses, killing people like Juan, as we remember him, and Berta, and many others across the region and across many other regions. So what we see is that instead of supporting people where they want to stay, we provide insufficient policies. And when people need to flee, we restrict their access to uh, seek asylum, which is a human right. It's something that we all have for being humans. The consequences of these policies uh, will continue to bring more suffering and will continue to impose suffering upon the border. And let me tell you, the border is not chaos. The border is not a crisis. The border is not a problem. 
I lived at the border and I found at the border a community of love, of joy, of hope, of resistance, of family unity, of cultural richness, a community where people can thrive and a community where people can encounter the other and be the other and find themselves in the other and no longer be the other, but be a wider we, a wider us. We know that after the elections, the reality is going to be challenging. No candidate has embraced humane policies at the border. We continue to see this false idea that if we increase the pain of, against people on the move, then they will stop arriving. They will stop seeking the right to seek safety. And they will stop trying to reunite with their families and pursue their dreams. After the elections, we will continue to work as we are doing right now, providing humanitarian care, organizing to drop water at the desert as we are doing to try to save lives, and also organizing to support and ask our decision makers to pass legislation and to implement policies that respect the dignity of everyone and respect the humanity of everyone in movement. We are very excited to do that with you all to do that with our faith leaders across the nation. I'm proud to be working with the Interfaith Immigration Coalition to demand better of our decision makers and to tell them very clear that our faith values call us to welcome, call us to be communities that embrace everyone and communities where everyone has the chance to thrive and to find opportunities. So we launched a petition campaign uh, that you can find in the webpage faithforasylum.com. And so we highly encourage you to sign that petition and to let others know. And we highly encourage you to join border organizations like HOPE and like many others uh, in their quest to provide support to people in movement and also raise awareness about the realities at the border to change the narrative, to change the idea that the border is something that is a problem and instead support the idea that the border is a solution, the border is where we find ourselves and where we find our country, and the border can be also a place where we can implement humane policies that respect everyone's dignity. I'll be more than happy to uh, continue the conversation offline, online, hopefully anytime in person, and thanks so much everyone for this opportunity to speak with you all today. And I know Jesus would have loved to have been here, but the time change made it very difficult. And so um, I'm going to pass to Deb Lee and Jose Rubin. But before I do, I just want to say Juan Lopez vive and presente for Juan Lopez. Thank you. Gracias, Renaldo. And thank you so much. Um, that was a lovely video. You should be very proud, Professor Amy, one of your students is doing an amaz amazing work. I'm gonna help us connect the dots. Jose Rubin and I are gonna help connect the dots um, of like what what is what migrants are facing and um, hear what's driving people out, what they're facing at the border and that what many face even on this side. And if we can imagine um, you know, the America is one continent and imagine what's happening here, um, here in California. So we can go to the next slide, Danny. So I want to just give a little snapshot of immigration detention, um, across the country, immigration detention is on the rise. Once again, we are now at a detained population of about 41,000 people. So it has gone up, um, been increasingly going up since the COVID pandemic. So repopulating those detention facilities and ICE is seeking a budget. This is budget season coming up in November. They're, they are seeking an increase in their budget to be able to detain 50,000 people, which is approaching to where we were with the Trump administration in terms of budget. So. We are very concerned about immigration detention facilities. They People inside include people who come to the border and find themselves, instead of being able to arrive safely um, and arrive to reconnect with a family member, may find themselves in immigration detention. There are also people who are long-term residents, our neighbors, 
our friends, our colleagues, people who are part, members of our church and schools, who are long-term residents who also end up finding themselves in immigration detention, including people who may have come on refugee status or may have been legal permanent residents. Um, so in California, we have been on a campaign since part of a larger coalition called Dignity Not Detention since 2012 to reduce immigration detention beds uh, because we know that the less immigration detention centers there are, the safer all of our communities are. And the less ICE immigration and enforcement is able to happen here in our local communities. So since 2012, we have closed down collectively nine detention centers, and that includes all of them in Northern California and several that were had contracts at county jails in Southern California as well. So what remain are what you see here on this map. And in the past three years, we've engaged in a pilgrimage, uh, kind of a week long pilgrimage to go to each one of these detention sites to lift up and draw attention to the stories that are inside and um, the communities in, in which they live. And, and detention, I will just say, just to connect the dots a little bit, is another highly extractive industry, extractive to the local communities and extractive of human life and dignity. So on our bus this year, we had 50 people and 20 people were folks who had been formerly incarcerated and detained inside these detention facilities. So their presence on the bus to revisit these detention sites together in community and to be able to re-experience, um, re um, re, be able to retell their experience of detention to um, the wider bus and also the wider community is really important. I'm gonna pass it on to Jose Rubin to, to share a little bit about each of the places. Thank you, Reverend Deb. Um, so yeah, as you can see, um, we're dealing with the, with the mass, uh, well, the expansion of detention centers. So, I mean, as you can see to my left or to on your screen, uh, we do have a, a slide of the uh, of the Golden State Annex and Mesa Verde uh, detention facilities that are basically located in Kern County. Um, you know, one thing about these two detention centers is that uh, is they have been growing this population uh, of of people detained. Right, that's uh, right now there's like a, a over three hundred seventy nine people detained in these facilities. Yeah, one of the things that also they've been known is for like the the neglect for COVID nineteen medical assistance. Um, we also you know been organizing with our with our inside leaders uh, that are our detained leaders that are basically have been launching labor strikes, uh, hunger strikes, and basically just to basically try to hold these places accountable, right? Um, as you can see, there's a picture of me my uh myself on on the right. Uh, I was myself. I was detained uh for about sixteen months. Uh, I, I was released barely last year um, by the by the support of the community. I'm, I'm free. Um, I've been basically working hard to basically get my my bachelor's degree. And nowadays, I'm actually you know going to to a college. I am the spiritual activist with the Interfaith Movement for Human Integrity. I've been basically been really vocal about uh, all the all the uh, mistreatment and abuse that I've gone through in these detention centers. So if we could go on to the next slide, please. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Oh, and I just wanted to just. I uh, also mentioned that uh, just basically that uh, the Mesa Verde and Golden State Annex are actually uh, are contracted with for, for $105 million a year. Um, and basically, which it's it's just misinvested money in, into these facilities. And we're, but we've seen that we we had done the math and we found out that we could actually, you know, you you could we could actually get 11,000 new homes in, in our in our communities, right? Instead of basically paying 105 million dollars to these detention to these these two detention centers, right? Um, so what you see right here is uh basically the Adelanto Ice Processing Center and the Desert View Annex, uh, in which the what stands out about this one, this these facilities that they're like the deadliest facilities uh in California uh which had they have already had over 12 deaths um and had multiple lawsuits um basically organizers have been working so hard to basically uh, uh close down the Adelanto Ice Prison Center in which they only have three people detained in, in in there but they're still working hard to work with local public uh, officials to basically apply for uh for funds that are that have been allocated to to uh to anybody who's basically who's willing to divest from these detention centers and invest into more healthier economies. 
Uh, as you can see to my right, uh, to your right, you're going to see uh, Omar. Uh, he's a Mauritanian uh, uh, detained lead leader who has basically, who was released uh, barely last year as well. Um, he has been basically uh, just an amazing, just getting to know him and basically on a, on a, on a personal level, he's been, he's just an amazing, uh, amazing human being. He nowadays he's working. He's basically um, given back to his community. He's been participated. He has participated in the pilgrimage for two years already. So really an honor to be, get to know him. Um, and for these two facilities, they, I just want to uplift a uh, highlight that basically, um, they are contracted for $142 million a year. Um, uh, and we have done the, uh, we, we have looked for uh, what we can do for these, with, with this, with these, with this, this large amount of money. Right. And we seen that we could actually pay, uh, over, a uh, 1,500 new teachers with this amount of money. Right. So once again, it's misinvested money, and we we done the math where we where we could actually invest it into basically education as well. Um, now, uh, as you can see, we're on the um, this is Calexico. This is the Imperial uh, ICE Detention Center. Um, it's the second uh, overpopulated uh, detention center of of six hundred fifteen people. Um, this the this place has been uh, been super difficult for uh, for undocumented. Uh, people to organize because of how close it is to the border uh we do see that there is like these these policies that are they're racially profile uh our communities basically that threaten our communities with deportations um uh which you can see to to our right uh is basically one of our uh detained uh, uh formerly detained leader who was basically who was organizing and it was an organizer who was basically uh, uh, an attorney for those that were inside. I mean, was really supportive of, of his of the people that that he was detained with. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, th this year he basically lost his life. Uh, and as you can and during our pilgrimage, we actually conducted a pilgrimage. Uh, uh, we, we conducted a vigil for him, you know, because of in remembrance of of, of his of his life. Uh, and the great human being that he is. Um, once again, I want to highlight that this facility is actually gained forty-five million dollars a year, uh, and we've done the have done the math in which we could actually use. We could actually pay two thousand and <clears throat> pay healthcare for two thousand and six hundred six hundred veterans. Once again, misinvested money, and we see we we also are also looking for where we can actually invest this, these these fundings. Uh, if we could go on to the next slide, please. Um, as you can see right here, we're at the uh, we we we're here at the San uh, the Old Time Mesa ICE Detention in Center in San Diego. Um, San Diego is the um, it is the most overpopulated ICE detention facility of of a thousand two hundred thirty nine people. Today, uh, today we we do see that they are uh housing women. They are detaining women in there as well as men. Um, it is um. Uh, as you can see um, to your right, we do have one of our, again, one, so one of our directly impacted leaders that uh, his name is Noel. Uh, he is a native born of Jamaica. Uh, the, 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 the sad story about him is that he was actually detained in, in, in he was detained in ICE custody for five years uh, and which just basically just shows the prolonged detention. Uh, but basically this year he was released and basically uh, so far he's uh, upon his release. He's just basically been so vocal about sharing his story and bringing awareness of all the abuse and mistreatment that are that and the prolonged attention in, the, in, in here in the U.S. Right. So um, once again, uh, this this facility uh, is actually getting one hundred and thirty eight million dollars a year. Um, and like once again, imagine we, we and we've seen that we could actually provide 14,000 new homes, you know, with this, this amount of money, um, just shows that where, where we need, where we need to invest our monies and where we need to invest tax up taxpayer dollars and where, where we need to divest from. Right. So, um, we can go on to the next slide, please. So uh, now I want to just basically, uh, uh, share more about what's the res what is the resistance from inside, right? What are our detained leaders doing from the inside? Um, it's, Basically, I just want to share that uh, in the last six months, there has there have been uh, three hunger strikes of over 200 people at the Mesa Verde Ice Detention Center, uh, the Golden State Annex, and the Desert View Annex uh, in Adelanto. Um, basically, what they have been doing is basically protesting against uh, because of the a thousand over a thousand violations that uh, the ICE had violated further standards, right? And our detained leaders have basically been documenting all this. Um, 
So they have basically took the measures of going on hunger strike because, you know, they're basically just uh, not adhering to their to their to their complaints. Um, as you can see to our right, we do have uh, one of our detained uh, organizers who have been his name is Carlos Vasquez, who has been uh, basically he has been detained for all close to two years already. Um, he has been leading a hunger strike, hunger strikes in Adelanto. Um, but unfortunately, uh, ICE has took measures by placing him in solitary confinement. To this, to, even to this day, he's still in solitary confinement. Um, I also want to basically uh, uh, share that because of these hunger strikes, um, you know, folks have been transferred to. Uh, we have had two detained leaders. Uh, one, his name was Alfredo, and the other one is Antonio. They were transferred to the to the state of um, of Tacoma, Washington, uh, in retaliation for their hunger strikes. Um, and basically we, we also want to just uplift, uh, what are the demands of our, of our detained leaders, right? What is it that they're fighting for this similar to what we, what I was fighting for when I was on a hunger strike last year and, and, and when I was detained, uh, they, they are demanding for the termination of the ice con ice and geo contracts. Uh, they are basically demanding for their freedom, a fair review of their, of their, of their custody, uh, and basically to end completely solitary confinement um, and to stop that, to end the violation of all the standards that, that ICE have basically um, has in place, right? And basically to provide uh, provide free phone calls in the meantime, because right now they just cut up all the free phone calls, which basically they have no way to, to con connect with their families. Um, they are also, um, they also seek, they, they wanna basically bring these demands and actually speak to the uh, ICE office field director. But unfortunately, the ICE office field director has been uh, reluctant to basically, you know, meet with our detained leaders. Uh, if you could go on to the next slide, please. So what is the, what are we doing? From the, what is the resistance from the outside, right? Uh, uh, so far, uh, you know, the organizers, uh, faith leaders, uh, uh, you know, all advocates have been basically have uh, uh basically committed to like doing monthly vigils and rallies outside of the uh San Francisco uh office right uh basically we're all we're out there basically really trying to bring uh awareness and uplift you know their you know our detained leaders stories and basically to bring up and to continue to you know push for their demands because ICE is just trying to cover up all these abuses and mistreatments and, and but it's up to us to basically be their be their voice out here be their be the uh uh their at the the uh, their support from the outside. So that's what we've been committed to doing these these um these rallies and vigils outside of the San Francisco uh, ICE office, as well as the uh you know we have had folks going going to like the um you know the the L A uh ICE office too as well. So for for our folks in Adelanto, um and we have have we have launched three uh three pilgrimages already. The, you know in the last past three years, uh basically. It, this through these pilgrimage we've been connecting with local folks to we're also bringing awareness of heal which is five million dollars that has been allocated to the state uh where counties could basically who for for counties who who would wish to divest from these ice detention centers and actually invest into a better uh environmental jobs so you know, the, the, we're bringing awareness that these 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 funds are actually available for their for their local counties to basically divest from these 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 carceral systems right which at the end of the day they are carceral um and we are also basically we have been able to basically get SB eleven thirty two passed and signed by the governor, uh which is the uh which will uh give uh public health officials uh the the um the the uh, the the authority to come into these facilities and actually do investigations, uh and this is something that's been that hasn't been done in the past so this this year that that was passed. Uh, there is also the uh, the a dollar a day lawsuit um, uh, for the uh, that that's in place against this this the, the Mesa Verde and Conste Annex as uh, because of the exploitation that's taking place. You know that these facilities are are paying a dollar a day to our detained uh, people for for working right for for working for eight hour eight hour jobs. So uh, that's one of the, so the many res, uh, acts of resistance that that uh, the community is doing. So um, and. Just wanted to thank you all, and I wanted to pass it over to uh, our next presentation. Deb, I think that's you and I. Thank you, Jose Ruben. Yeah. It was really powerful to hear. We, you know, some of us that couldn't go were watching for through all the posts on Facebook and yeah. 
Um, so it was really amazing to hear. So um, I think Deb and I are going <laughs> to are going to yeah. talk about opportunities and fears. Correct, Kayla? Yeah, well, I um, we're also going to be joined. I have to give them the Zoom link by one of the folks we're accompanying. So if you all want to begin, I'm going to send them the, the correct link. So I'll I'll get off mine for just a second. Okay. And then if you, yeah, just let us know when they're here. Or Deb, I can go and then you can close us. Um, you know, I think for me, the this last year, I've had the honor to be able to um, be at the border. So I was able to be in El Paso and Ciudad Juarez in, in April. Um, I was in Tijuana last weekend. <laughs> Um, and so I was able to to see, you know, the impacts of our border policies. But one thing that I'm, and I'm going to start with this, I, I visited a space of, of these amazing art, artist, feminist art space. And on the, the outside of the wall, it said, um, from this lad, from this side, there are dreams too. De este lado también hay sueños. And um, I, I think it really, it, it really shook me, you know, doing this work around the root causes of migration, um, that we talk about immigration and we talk about the border and the numbers, but but we need to talk about the families and the stories and our policies. And so I have a lot of fears. <laughs> um, you know, I think I'm afraid of continued bombs being dropped on on families in 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 Gaza, in Lebanon, in Sudan in Burma, where my, my, my partner's family's from, and the violence in Haiti, and, and, and the violence that is existing in Mexico, and El Salvador, and Honduras, and, you know, and, and our, you know, whether or not our, our government has direct, <laughs> direct links, like we see in Gaza, um, and, and Central America, or, or some more indirect weapons manufacturing is the cause of this conflict that then pushes people to migrate. And, and a, a deep capitalist society that allows businesses to do whatever they want, can cross as many borders as they need, but can come freely when, you know, and people that, you know, are impacted by those business decisions can, can, cannot move freely. So I have a lot of fears. Um, and and both governments, you know, I, I'm 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 deeply fearful, um, and I'm angry about the Biden Harris's policies um, towards Gaza, towards the border, um, and in Central America. But one opportunity is is that a, a Harris and a Harris government, we can still advocate freely. We can have these talks. We can be together in the streets. We can be pushing for more just, humane. Um, laws. We can be pushing um, our ambassadors for a better foreign policy, our secretary of state, and, and we have access. Um, you know, Reynaldo didn't talk about his nephew, but his nephew was also detained. Um, and it was really horrific. But we had the capabilities to reach out to Congress people who could pressure the State Department um, to be able to get the release of people. And so, that for me is something that I'm hopeful for with the Harris administration. It's an opportunity, and and under the Trump and uh, under a Trump administration, I can't even imagine the chaos, but also the fear, what he will do to migrant communities, what he will do abroad, and what the foreign policy will look like, but what he'll also do to all of us, to faith leaders and activists that want to be on the streets with, with community leaders, with their compañeros, advocating for a better world. And so for me, that's, that's the Harris administration is still opportunity for us to continue pushing. Um, as angry as I can be in this moment, I can still be hopeful for the possibilities of us being together in this struggle with our, with our compañeros and compañeras, with our folks across the border in Mexico and Central America and in Gaza and Lebanon and Sudan and Burma and then the ability to advocate. And so I think our interpreter is here to pass it on to our next speaker. And then Deb, I'll let you kind of finish out those hopes and, and fears and opportunities at the end. And then happy to take questions then too. Thank you so much, Amy. We do have Crystal, the interpreter, but we're trying to patch in Diata, who is the speaker. So I'll let you, Deb, go while we get um, Diata on the line. Yeah, 
Thank you, Amy. I think I was um, really sad all day today because I was just just thinking about this topic, and um, it's hard to feel the find the opportunity. Although I'll take yours, what you mentioned, Amy. Um, I do. There's a lot. You know, I feel like human dignity is just um, in a state of emergency right now in so many places. Um, whether it's like the sweeping of the raiding of homeless camps now being legal to the bombing of Gaza and Lebanon and then you know forcing people out like where are people supposed to go and uh, really just just breaks my heart and, and connecting all these things and I think that's why we keep trying to show the connection of all of the funding you know the 20 billion dollars they now want to send in more weapons and bombs um, to Israel and the 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 millions of dollars you heard mentioned today that's going into immigration detention we didn't even mention the the billions you know at the border wall so um so much human need so much human need and um so we have an election where it's always an opportunity for us to try to put our values into policy um, there's one very important election thing I want to share, and that is on the California ballot, Proposition 36, which would have a horrible consequences of putting uh, thousands of people back into prison who have been recently released in the last decade. And that would also include many people who are immigrants, um, legal permanent residents, long-term residents who would not only get back into prison, be put back into prison, but then also be put into immigration detention centers for deportation. So um, one important election thing that I that we can we can win this, you know, is to like defeat Proposition 36. So one thing on the election um, in terms of Trump and Harris, you know, Trump is promising mass detention, mass deportations. He's rallying on that. He's rallying on the border. He's betting that immigration is going to be his winning issue. And unfortunately, it seems like the Democrats have kind of acquiesced that because they have done many pre-election anti-immigrant policies as well. Uh, obviously, it would be um, more terror and chaos under the Trump administration. He's also promising to end DACA, to end TPS. Um, to create new camps along the border and be sure, you would be sure that all branches of enforcement would become highly emboldened under a Trump administration. So we would be dealing with emboldened police, sheriffs, jails, prisons across the country who would be are already not on our side and would be even worse and would be even harder to put them into check and to hold them accountable as our state has tried to do. Um, I think for the faith community, sanctuary is going to be needed to be activated in a much more intense way. And um, also it will be interesting to see what will California do, which has tried to position itself as a counter to the Trump administration's values. Um, what will California do? How far will they be willing to go? And what can we ask of our state in that situation? Under the Harris administration, um, you know, once Biden came in, the Democratic Party just put their hands off immigration and it was like anything goes and they moved more to the right. So I'm concerned. But, um, you know, what we're going to see is the continuation of their already heavily restrictive policies, the border closures, the push for more detention expansion, up to 50,000 beds, including a new detention center they're seeking in California, which will probably also be in the Central Valley. Um, and increased prosecutions. You know, Southeast Asians are facing like a 300% increase in deportations and immigration prosecution. So it's that's probably not going to change. Um, they're going to continue to offshore immigration enforcement, as Amy mentioned, to Mexico, to Guatemala, and Colombia. Uh, so we will all still need to do sanctuary. We'll still need to do more to protect our neighbors and our loved ones. And we'll have to push more on the contradictions. The Democratic Party and Biden and Harris say all the things. They've adopted our talking points, but they've done nothing, but they do the opposite. So we will really have to push hard um, uh, on, on the many contradictions that are being lived out and to be strong and firm and bold in our values as people of faith that um, 
that's that's my hope. That's my hope that we will come together around that for immigrants, for people who are homeless and houseless, for communities of color in the United States and for our siblings in many other countries who are being attacked and bombed. Oh, so I think that Diatha might be on in time to do her testimony. Is that right? Yes. Yes, yes, they're getting her set up right now. Um, I'm so sorry. I know it took longer. Um, Ziata Fotasu. Um, let I'll translate. I'll tell her right now. Ziata for it's here to sum you up a pali, okay? Um, yes. Oh, wait. Can you see Diata? Yes. Yes. Okay. Over. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Crystal. Um, of course. I just want to, and you can remove the slides, Danny, so we can just see Chris uh, Diata. I just want to welcome Diata to this space. Diata, um, a mother, an advocate, a community member who our organization has been blessed to get to know um, since she immigrated here from Haiti. Um, over a year ago now. And we just wanted to give her an opportunity to share with you all, um, especially given the dehumanizing stories that are flowing through media. We wanted just more opportunities to lift up the humanity, the strength, the resilience. And I'm speaking really fast. I'm so sorry. Um, Crystal, did you want me to add you as a, the interpreter? Yes. Okay. Do you want to do you want to share explain that to Diata first? Um, you can. I think at the end I'll just tell her a high level what you said, so she can um tell her story. Okay. Um, sorry. Oh, oh no, how do I add? I, you may have had to pre-add it, do you think? Oh, darn, I thought I would be able, oh wait, here, let me see. Oh no, add interpreter. Okay, give me one second. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Crystal. Why is it? Um, you know what? It's not coming up. Your name isn't coming up, Crystal. It's um if you can't do it that way, I don't mind just coming off mute every time. Okay. You know, me and Jata don't really do this over the phone. Okay. So I think we should be pretty good to be able to do it. Okay, go for it, please. Jata, la? Yes, I'm la. <laughs> okay, Jata, so le wa parler, wa bon mon petit temps pour me capable traduire pour, OK? Parce que ça yo vle vraiment, ça madame nan vle pour faire, c'est pour ba et raconter un petit cal de histoire parce que en pile moi mon ça nous connaît on pas qu'être bonne mauvais et histoire à raconter sur haïtien spécialement dans okay. l'élection ça so okay. dit mon ça que ou gain plus que deux ans qu'on en pays hein et que il était vle comme si pour te venir pour te capable parler de histoire qui sont passé qui et covid là et puis comme si pour capable lever mon petit gens pour pas penser comme si c'est vieux bagage seulement qui yo parler sur haïtien OK um, so, so is there something specific you want her to touch on Yeah we just we wanted for Diata to share what has been her experience settling here. What does she want the public elected officials to know about her and her family and community? And and just what are her hopes for her family now that she's here? So Diata, let's go back to you to talk about your own experience ou même avec femme ou depuis nous vini là aux États-Unis OK dis comme ça que qui sort à même monde qui là connaît um, de ou même avec famille et puis qui rêve vous gagner pour ou même avec famille OK Parlez-nous 
Bon, depuis le nouvel ici, moi-même, Marim, petit moi, aller à l'école, apprendre très bien. Marim, à travailler, pas j'en perdre le travail, aller travailler chaque jour, moi-même aussi tout. Um, she said, since me, my husband, and my kids um, got to the U.S., you know, my kids have been able to go to school. My husband is working. Um, so am I. So that is very good. Continue, Nodiata. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Okay, she said, you know, one of our biggest dream is to, you know, hopefully one day to buy a house so our kids can have their own space um, and then we can be comfortable. We also have other dream. I'm actually, you know, I'll step in for just a second. Something that I don't normally do as an interpreter, I'll also say that you know, I'm very close with Diata and I know her kids and I know one of them, her dream is to become a doctor. And that makes Diata very, very, very proud. And it's so nice to see her kids thriving, especially the older ones, um, because, you know, they did not grow up here. They just got here, but they are doing so good. And I believe one of them is actually an owner all student. So I can tell you, you know, they are thriving. Majute puta de Diata. Continue to talk. Who else have you got to do with Petit Tuyo? Well, Petit Mwen, the first film, he said that he had to finish the school and then he had to learn a doctor to do a great operation. That's what he had to do. And he had to learn very well. Yeah. She actually just told the same thing I just said. She said, actually, my first daughter, her big dream is to um, become a doctor. Um, and that's what she would love to do. So that makes us very proud. Et et qui sont arrivés mais dimanche qui n'a pas lieu d'y être. Et puis pour on gagne petit bas somme là qui fait boule très bien et puis en pile en pile mon remède parce que façon je boule la livre vraiment intelligent en pile. Yeah, and I have my her third child which um which is a boy. He is very good at soccer. Um, he is one of the stars um student for his school and um he loves it. Qui sont encore? Qui sont les dix mots qu'on appelle yo? Qui sont les mots qu'on connaît? Qui sont les mots qu'on connaît? Oui. Bah bien comprendre. Comme si, pas pas penser exactement qui mon mon ça y est déjà. Des pour qui ça a fait réunion? Fait réunion c'est pour tête ça. Yo parler de haïtien yo. Ah ok. Yo comme si que qui sont les bagages ou t'as mais qu'on est spécialement basé sur expérience qu'on fait des pouvoirs. Ok. Well, but I'm not open. Eh? Mm. I'm, I'm, I'm tell, you know, I'm trying to tell her to tell, um, to talk more about, you know, what she would love, what else she would love for you guys to know, the, especially the people on the call. But if you have specific questions, maybe she can answer because it's a little yeah. hard for her to just, um, kind of say, you know, what she wants you guys to know. Yeah. I'd love, and we could open it up too. I'd love to hear from Diata. I know that now that she's here with her family, she's also mm -hmm. trying to bring other family members from Haiti. So mm -hmm. I'd, I'd love to hear who has come or who she's hoping that can join her. Okay. Diata, I said that you have to come here and you have to do everything for you and you have to bring your own family to Haiti and to come here. You have to know who is already here to come and who is in Haiti to come here to come here. Okay. Okay. Yes, I have a friend who is in Haiti and 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 who is in Haiti. Um, um, she has a brother that's already here. Um, and then, um, she has a sister right now that's struggling with everything that's going on in Haiti that she would love to bring over. Um, I see another question here. I'll read it. What has been some of her challenges here? Okay. Data, qui difficulté, um, parler de difficulté qu'on rencontre depuis l'on vient et de pour l'on a vivi cite là. Qui pi go difficulté qu'on rencontre? L'homme t'apprend très ici? Non, non, non. 
pendant à vivre ici qui difficulté qui bagaille qui difficile pour um, et ou ka parler de comme si l'autre a cherché kai ou bien bagaille comme ça bon ou bien plus gros difficulté plus gros difficulté c'est kai kai vraiment pas facile jusqu'à présent non kai on pas à l'aise à cause de timonio de chaque jour mon n'a frappé porte moi il y a dit timonio a jouer en l'air faut petit plus dormir en bas Ça veut dire nous vraiment pas à l'aise. Puis gros problème là c'est Kai. Yeah, she said. Um, so for some of the challenges, she said it's really like finding housing. You know, even right now, um, you know, she was able to um rent somewhere, but it's very difficult, especially she has kids. You know, um, you know, it's really not the most comfortable, um, for her and her family. Kilot, kilot difficulty. Oui, c'est ça qui est difficulté. Any other questions for her? Is there one last question for Diata? Yes, I, I so have a question. I have a question. I was wondering, has she found any good spots for um Haiti cuisine, for Haitian cuisine? Diata, mais c'est à dire une question. Est-ce que je viens à quel bon côté bon ici là pour manger bon manger ici? <laughs> oh, est-ce que je viens bon côté ici à manger bon manger ici? Oui, je viens et ça, on connaît manger bon manger ici là dans le Blanc. Qui restaurant? Chaka? Oui. She said, um, she laughed. <laughs> Um, I can tell you she's a great cook. Diata cooks for me sometime. But um, she also goes to the Haitian restaurant that's here mm -hmm. in Oakland, downtown Oakland. There's a restaurant called Chaka. Um, she sometimes goes there. Oh, yeah. I can testify. Yes. I can definitely testify to that, too. She's an amazing cook. Um, yes. Every chance I get, if Diata's not working, I get in at least one or two yes. meals from Diata. Yes. Well, thank you so much, um, Diata, for all that you give to your family and community. We put in the chat an article that she wrote um, in the San Francisco Chronicle, an op-ed, lifting up her, her voice in response to the, the, the rhetoric. So please take time to read it and share it. Um, we're just grateful to have her here in our community. And thank you so much, Crystal. Um, for being a part of the beloved community as well. We are gonna transition um, to close. We have, we wanted to just share a few calls to action and then we're gonna close with a prayer, um, a prayer for this election, election time. So um, if you could show the slide of just a few, ways that we would love to have you all continue to be in this movement with us, this fight with us. Um, there's ways that we want to continue to lift up justice for Juan Lopez, um, learning about the faith for asylum that Jesus lifted up. We'll also email all of these out to folks there's an opportunity to volunteer at the Contra Costa Immigrant Court, which is where folks in Northern California are now being directed to face immigration court. We're setting up a volunteer program there that Nadia is leading. For those inside um, detention, there's going to be a Dia de los Muertos vigil outside of the ICE facility on October 31st. Um, and after this election takes place. We want to bring us all together in the Bay Area for a, an evening of song and community. So we're inviting you to a concert, Love Over Fear, um, that will be in Berkeley with some beautiful performances. And then we're right back to work in action um, after that concert. There's going to be efforts to lift up the calls to pardon, to stop deportations of our community members in Sacramento. And last, just lifting up again with these propositions, um, pushing for a yes on Proposition 6 and a no on 36. And we can share information about that. And with that, 
I want to turn it to Danny Thonsi, who's going to close us in prayer. Uh, thank you, Kayla, and thank you, everyone, for um, sharing. And uh, just reflecting on what we have shared, my heart is, is you know, is broken as what, what is currently going on. And also at the same time, um, I'm hopeful. It's just because through prayers and through collective action that we can um, definitely get things done. And also just by hearing um, you know, testimony at our latter end, it also, in a sense, um, uh, makes my heart full as well. So well, with that being, um, I just want to... Um, us to um, open up our hearts, our minds, as we pray, as we lift up uh, these words of uh, from our hearts, our cries with words, and even the cries within our hearts that we unable to uh, other. Uh, we want to uh, honor um, Juan Antonio Lopez for just the legacy for his life. We we lift him up, and the many uh, of those who um, have crossed over and to escape war, to escape the harsh, cruel environment, to to uh, escape the violence, to escape um, everything that is going on within the homeland. We we uh, we lift them up, and we pray for their safety. We also want to honor those who lost their lives as well, seeking for a better life. We honor them. We lift them up. We lift up those who are currently uh, detained. We will not forget about them. And we lift up those who are on hunger strike, those who are fighting for the dignity, fighting for what they should uh, have coming, fighting for their freedom. We, we pray for these closures of these... Um, detention center. We pray for these closure of these prisons, these jail. As human beings, as we are created, these are not are here at the beginning, these uh, man-made institution. We, we were created to love one another. We were created to uplift one another, not to harm each other, not to uh, not to exploit each other. We, we, we pray that all these things would be done away with. We we also want to lift up to you uh, those who have come home from these cruel and harsh system. We want to continue to pray for their healing. We want to continue to pray for their support. We also want to lift up their voices as well as they continue to uh, live up their lives here and to also to try to tr make transformation with with their experiences. Uh, we we want to lift up. Uh, what's going on in Gaza, the people, the Palestinian people who have lost their lives. We, we, uh, we pray for peace. We pray for mercy. We pray for peace. We pray that this war will end. We continue to pray that our government will step in, will stop this cruelty, that uh, their heart would be uh, softened, that their that they will listen to the cries of their hearts, they listen to the cries of the spirits and stop being fearful and stop playing these political games and stop stop 